Hello, I'm Chris, and today on Curzy Fabrications, I'm gonna be taking a look at the Crowdy Ender 5 3D printer. Let's go. In case you missed it a couple of weeks ago, I did a live stream in which I unboxed, built, and ran my first test print on a Creality Ender 5 3D printer. If you missed that, click this link to watch the condensed video. Be sure to check out the description of that video for time codes to specific parts of the build process. Since that stream, I've been running some test prints to see just how well the Ender 5 performed on a number of different 3D models. But before I show you what I've printed, let's take a look at the printer itself. Let's first look at the construction of the printer. The main appeal of the design is the rigid frame which the entire printer is built around. Each of the 2020 or 2040 extrusions are screwed directly to one another, which leads to virtually no flex once assembled. The movement of this design is actually really elegant and simple. I originally thought this design was based on the Core XY or HBOT, but after doing some research, it's vastly different, and I could find no other printer with a similar design. If you know of one, please leave a comment below. Each of the axes has one stepper motor, and all movement in the X and Y directions are accomplished with rollers directly mounted to the V-slot extrusions. This means less hardware and less mounting that could go off square to the frame. The X-axis stepper is your usual belt-driven design, but here it goes around the 2020 extrusion. The Y-axis stepper is what makes this printer really unique as it uses this double access motor to drive both sides of the gantry at the same time. It goes around the extrusions, which like the X-axis, does provide a nice channel for the belts. Finally, the Z-axis stepper drives a lead screw that's centrally mounted between two 10 mm guide rods, which are an upgrade from the usual 8 mm rods found on many low-cost printers. The movement is extremely smooth to the point that the build plate usually just falls due to gravity once the stepper has been disengaged, such as at the end of printing. During my test prints, I experienced zero skipping or uneven movements in the printing process. Nothing appears to be underpowered or misaligned. My only complaint about the construction is that the belts seem loose to me compared to how I normally tension them on my other printers. Unfortunately though, there's no way to tension them with the included hardware due to the fact they're crimped in place. With that being said, I haven't noticed any printing artifact that can be attributed to loose belts, so there may not be a functional problem here. A final note about the frame is about the included spool holder attached to the side. It holds a variety of sizes, it's durable enough for full one kilogram spools, and it doesn't put any additional strain on, on the frame that could affect your print quality. The electronics in the Ender 5 are a mix of custom, off the shelf, and or standardized components. Starting at the power supply, we have a really nice Meanwell 350 watt, 24 volt supply. This is the same or similar supply to the one provided in the Ender 3 Pro, and the same supply I chose for my large format printer for the heating beds. Going from the supplies, there are nice silicone wires with well done crimps. The whole cable management is actually nicely organized and clean. While they had a large space to work in, they took the time, straightened up, and zip tied all of the wiring. The main board in this printer is a Creality 3D V113 board running a modified Marlin firmware. I'm not sure though which drivers are on board, but I suspect DRV8825s. If you know, please comment below for others. The drivers definitely don't produce a silent print, but they're not overly loud either. I wouldn't want it in my bedroom, but a closed door seems to take care of most of the noise. Let's go over a few issues I found when assembling this printer. The first note about the construction of the frame is to be sure that you pay attention to the orientation of the uprights. There are holes in the posts that have to be at the top of the printer for assembly. If you assemble these in the wrong direction, you'll be pulling things apart to correct it. Next, as shown in my previous live stream, the connectors for all of the steppers, heating elements, and thermistors were all labeled in Chinese. This became a fun game for my daughter and I as we pulled out Google Translate to figure out which connector went to which element. And while this can be entertaining, almost all of the connectors map one to one, 
to the devices they go to. What I mean by this is that all of the wires except two should have unique connectors, colors, or wire gates that make figuring this out pretty easy. The only exception to this are the thermistors for the hot end and heat bed. These connectors are identical. So if you're faced with figuring these out, feel free to pull off your cell phone like I did or simply plug them in one at a time when you power on the machine to see if they're in the right location. The last thing worth mentioning about the construction is that for the longest time, I thought I had a warped print bed. As when I leveled the four corners, the middle of the bed seemed too low still. After thinking this through and doing some testing, I came to the realization that the actual print surface is larger than the specified 220 by 220 millimeters. It's actually 235 by 235. When I homed the printer or the print bed went to what I thought was the center, it was actually off by several millimeters. To fix this, I homed the printer, sent G-code to send the printer to what I thought was the center, measured to each edge, subtracted the difference and divided by two. Then I moved the X end stop by that amount. This took care of my bed leveling issue. With all consumer printers, safety should be a top concern. This is because with heated beds and hot ends, fires could be a real issue if temperatures got out of control. To test the basic functionality of the safety features, I unplugged the thermistor on the hot end to see what the printer would do if it could not sense a proper temperature. The normal response from a Marlin based printer would be to shut down and display an error. On this printer though, it simply stopped supplying power to the heating element. So when I plugged the thermistor back in, the temperature was lower than before I unplugged it. Trying the same thing on the heated bed produced the same results. So, while this isn't a thorough test, I did verify that basic thermal protections are in place. Now that we've covered the hardware of the printer, let's check out the printing process and take a look at some of the test prints. The first thing you do with any 3D model is import it into a slicer and produce G-code for your printer. By default, Creality ships this printer with a copy of the open source Cura on the USB or micro SD card along with the needed printer profile. This made it easy to get going with test prints. Once your file has been sliced, you can save the G code to the included micro SD card and insert it into the front of the printer. Once you select your file from the menus, the print bed will begin to heat up. This is usually the longest part of the heating process as the hot end is a lot quicker due to its smaller mass. With a 24 volt power supply, I would expect to quit heating time and I wasn't disappointed. Starting at 21 degrees Celsius ambient room temperature, the heating bed was able to get to 60 degrees Celsius in about 2 minutes and 15 seconds. To get up to 70 degrees Celsius, it took about 45 seconds more at 3 minutes. It's a relatively small print surface, so this is about what was anticipated. As seen in my live stream video, the first file I printed came pre-sliced on the micro SD card and it was simply called dog.gcode. This file took almost 11 and a half hours to print, but really produced a great sample. My estimate is that the maximum speed was probably around 40 millimeters per second and the layer height was 0.2 millimeters. The print had excellent layer transitions and the curves were very smooth and consistent. The next print I went for was a more challenging model, the Gare Anderson Cat which is a scan the world model from my mini factory. The model is fairly difficult to print due to its fine details and under chin overhang. Overall, the printer did remarkably well for this first print. The details are about what I expected without any special tweaking and for a model at this scale. The overhang survived and really only needs minimal cleanup with a sharp blade. A main complaint with the default slicer settings show up in the walls of this model. As you can see, the infill is visible throughout the smooth surfaces. This is easily fixed by taking the wall thickness to 1.6 millimeters, which will add an additional line of filament around each perimeter. This is always my default, whether for form or function. After printing the cat and tweaking my settings accordingly, I went to another challenging print, the Star Wars Death Trooper by Paul Braddock. This print has a lot of different curved geometries, overhangs, and therefore needed supports. The results are almost identical to that found on the dog print. The curves are beautiful and consistent, and the layer transitions are clean. In this plain white color I use for this print, I don't really notice the layers until the shallow transitions at the top. The supports broke off relatively easy, and I was able to remove all of them 
with needle nose pliers, even in the hard to reach areas. Now let's move on to some of the more technical prints to look at some more objective results. One of my biggest complaints on low cost printers is ghosting due to sharp angle transitions in the print. This is where we really test the construction of the printer as well as the settings for jerk and acceleration in the slicer. So for this test, all of those values were left as they came in the profile from Creality. This first small ghosting test can be found on Thingiverse. It's a piece that has both an open source and open builds logo on both sides, but one is embossed while the other is debossed. The first of these prints was performed with the max speed set at 50 millimeters per second. There's no visible ghosting on any edge of the piece. I printed a second one of these at 100 millimeters per second and again saw no visible artifacts. Due to the small size of the piece, I didn't expect any differences, but I wanted to test it nonetheless. Keep in mind that it takes time for a printer to hit maximum speed due to the jerk and acceleration settings, as well as just physics in general. Due to the small size of the model, there wasn't any real long runs for it to get going. This brings me to the next test, which is this camera case I designed. This model has long straight walls, which is perfect for looking at quick direction changes and vertical consistency. This model was printed at 60 millimeters per second, which is a common speed I print for many of my projects. Here we can see some ghosting on the long run before a hard stop. The corners though look quite good. The layer consistency is also quite good with an extremely smooth finish. Next, I printed a model specifically designed to look at printer dimensional accuracy. The CaliCat is my go-to model for calibrating my 3D printer. Not only does it have specific dimensions listed with the model, it's also a great little gift for children of all ages. My daughter really loves these. So right out of the box, the dimensional accuracy of the printer is very good. On the X and Y axis, we're looking for 20 millimeters, and on the X, I measured 20.10, and on the Y, I measured 20.05. On the Z axis, I like to measure from the bottom of the model to the top of the cat's head, which should be 30 millimeters. And I measured 30.02. Keep in mind that using the built-in menus on the printer, these settings can be dialed in even closer by changing your steps per millimeter. The final print I performed was Maker's Muse Tolerance Gauge, which can be used to find out the printer's tolerance when printing two walls close together. This is extremely important when designing mechanical components because this number is used to sort out proper printing dimensions, which are almost never the same as the ideal model. A good quality desktop printer with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle can usually achieve about a 0.2 millimeter tolerance, which is exactly what I got from the Ender 5. It required almost no force to free up the 0.2 knob, while the 0.15 knob couldn't be broken even with tools. So now I'm reaching the end of my review and I'd like to cover a few odds and ends that I haven't mentioned elsewhere. First, I did take a look at how the printer handled different materials such as carbon fiber and TPU. For carbon fiber, I found that the print quality was very good and it had no extrusion problems with the stock components. Just keep in mind that this sort of material will wear brass nozzles faster than standard PLA. For TPU, I first tested a short 85 TPU, which started to print fine, but could not make it through a test print without eventually finding its way out of the extruder. Testing a firmer TPU though, I had no problems completing a print at 40 millimeters per second. The quality was what I expected from the PLA prints, and even retractions work better than on other printers I've tested. Next, let's talk about the extruder itself. Functionally, this is a good extruder. I never saw any jerking or stuttering while printing at normal print speeds, and the path for filament is tight enough for firm or flexible filament. I don't love this extruder though for two reasons. One, the components are all plastic, and when you go to insert filament, you can feel the handle give a bit. I worry about this holding up over time. Two, it's kind of a pain to insert filament into the tube. I found a trick where if you cut the filament at a sharp angle, it will go in relatively easy, but sometimes this takes multiple cuts and just the right alignment. With both of those in mind, I went looking for a replacement for this extruder and found that Creality actually has an aluminum upgrade for these components right on their online store at creality3donline.com. At the time of this review, they were running a special for $7.99, so I ordered one and will report back on how well it works. 
My final concerns are about the removable bed. While I love the idea and it does make prints easy to remove, I found that this surface does not always cooperate. The first issue I found is that if the surface gets dirty and or oily, the only real way to clean it is with hot water and dish detergent. Alcohol did not do the job for me on this surface. Next, I find that I have to squish the filament into the plate more than I usually do for glass. I think these are problems I can live with now that I know about them, but I did have to have some Twitter and Facebook help to figure out the proper cleaning. So to wrap up, what I hope was a thorough but not too long-winded of a review, what are my final impressions of this printer and am I happy with the money that I spent on it? Ultimately, this printer does achieve what I purchased it for, which was to test out a cube design and to look at the print quality in such a design. It's not disappointing the least in that department. I believe the print quality is superior to both of the inexpensive i3 designs I have in my collection. One being a highly upgraded ANET A8 and the other a custom built AP8 printer. The issues I have with the printer, such as the extruder and the removable bed, I'm able to work around are actually really easy to upgrade or replace if I wanted to. Many people are going to wonder if this printer is worth the extra cost over an Ender 3 or an Ender 3 Pro. Unfortunately, I can't do a direct comparison since I don't own one of these other printers. But I do own printers that are similarly designed. My personal opinion is that this is a respectable upgrade for the cost, particularly if you already have a printer of that design and you're looking for something that produces a slightly higher quality piece. As a cosplayer and someone that does like to post process and finish a print as time allows, anything that the printer does better is one thing less that I have to sand flat or clean up in some other way. In fact, with that in mind, the real shortcoming in this printer is that I want a bigger build volume. Keep in mind that this is already bigger than the Ender 3 and the Z axis at 300 millimeters as opposed to 250 millimeters. But I want one of these at 300 by 300 or even 400 by 400 so I can print high quality helmets or other props. Hopefully, Creality will see this review and start working on it. Well, that's it for me on this one. I want to thank all of you that watched until the end of this video. I'd like to welcome you all to my channel and I encourage you to subscribe, like this video, and join me in the comments and other social media which I will include in the description. I have a lot of projects in mind and I'd love your encouragement and input. Also in the description you will find links to all of the models I printed in this video and links to channels or other external pages I may have mentioned. If you have any questions about the review and or suggestions for future videos, please leave those in the comments as well. Now. Go and make the world a better place through your creativity and inspiration. Bye, everybody.